Good afternoon. I am Tracy Fessenden. I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict. And I am delighted to welcome everyone to today's conversation, Righteous Reckoning, uh, Religion and the 2020 Election with Anthea Butler and Sarah Posner. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of quick items. Uh, if you'd like to participate in the audience Q&A of today's event, you can submit questions throughout the event. On Zoom, uh, you please use the Q&A function. On YouTube, use the chat box to the right of the video. Uh, we'll get to as many questions as we can. I want to extend a special welcome to our audience who learned about the event through Changing Hands, our local independent bookstore. We're pleased to partner with them today. And if you enjoy today's discussion, I'd also encourage you to get a copy of a couple of books. Uh, Sarah Posner's new book, Unholy, Why White Evangelicals Worship at the Altar of Donald Trump and Anthea Butler's book, Women in the Church of God in Christ, Making a Sanctified World. You can also pre-order Anthea's forthcoming book, White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America. And we will post links to Changing Hands where you can purchase these books. Today's event is part of the Center's Recovering Truth Project, funded by the Henry Luce Foundation. You can learn more about the project, watch our videos, listen to our podcast on our website, just Google Recovering Truth, uh, or follow us on Twitter at Recovering Truth. So we are thrilled to have Anthea Butler and Sarah Posner here with us today. Uh, these are two of my favorite people to be in conversation with about anything. And they're two of the most knowledgeable people uh, around to, with whom to be in conversation about religion in the 2020 election. Anthea Butler is the chair of graduate studies and professor of religious and Africana studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Her research and writing covers a range of topics, including religion and politics, religion and gender, African-American religion, sexuality, media, and popular culture. She's a frequent and sought after commentator on PBS, the BBC, MSNBC, CNN, the Washington Post, Religion News Service, and many other venues. Her book, Women in the Church of God in Christ, Making a Sanctified World, examines the lives and rise of influential women within the Church of God in Christ, the largest Pentecostal denomination in America. Her new book out in March is White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America. And in that book, Anthea argues that our fractured electorate, so visible to us in this election and its aftermath, is a product of the racial history of American evangelicalism. Anthea Butler uh, is soon to assume leadership of the American Society of Church History, a scholarly organization of religious historians. She also served as a national co-chair of Catholics for Biden at the invitation of the president elect. So she comes by her knowledge of this election, not only as a scholarly observer, but uh, from uh, within the trenches as well. Sarah Posner trained as a lawyer. Uh, she uh, uh, then turned to journalism and is a reporting fellow with Type Investigations and very luckily for us is a journalism fellow with our Recovering Truth Project. Her investigative reporting and analysis of the religious right in Republican, uh, and Republican politics has appeared in Rolling Stone, the New York Times, the Washington Post and many, many other publications. Sarah Posner is the author of the book, God's Prophets, Faith, Fraud and the Republican Crusade for Values Voters, which focuses on the role of the prosperity gospel uh, or prosperity movement in the rise of the Christian right. And her most recent book, Unholy, Why White Evangelicals Worship at the Altar of Donald Trump, examines the ideological underpinnings and forces influencing the course of Republican politics. So in this very tense, and fraught moment following a uniquely divisive presidential election in a year marked by a pandemic and a long overdue and halting reckoning with systemic racial injustice in our nation's history and present, we are extraordinarily fortunate to have these two experts here to help us think through some of what we're, we are witnessing. So Anthea Butler, Sarah Posner, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having us, Tracy. Yes, Tracy, thank you. So righteous reckoning, religious in the 2020 election. We're eager for your takeaways. Uh, what did religion look like in this election? How did it work? What surprised you? What didn't surprise you? 
but before you answer, I'd like to try to situate that question uh, with a concrete example, because it's easy when talking about religion and the electorate, particularly, to imagine religions as variables or boxes that we can move around on a chart, when religions are always embedded in other forms of uh, relating to one another, other forms of organizing ourselves uh, in terms of race, gender, and otherwise. So Sarah reminded me uh, in an exchange this morning uh, to uh, look again at Georgia, as we know control of the Senate uh, comes down to two runoff elections in Georgia between Democrat Joel Ossoff and Republican David Perdue and between Democrat Raphael Warnock and Republican Kelly Loeffler. Uh, Warnock is a black, the black pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church, of course, uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s congregation. Uh, Kelly Loeffler is white. And she has targeted Warnock's support of Barack Obama's pastor, Jeremiah Wright, uh, who drew fire during that election for his sermons against racism. She's also targeted Warnock's own sermons, including a 2016 sermon at Emory in which she urged Americans to repent of our worship of whiteness. And that was a 2016 sermon. It came after the Access Hollywood tape uh, in response of Trump's white Christian supporters, which as we recall was to give Trump a pass for predatory uh, behavior. So in targeting his anti-racist, Warnock's anti-racist sermons as dangerous and un-American, Loeffler positions white Christians as arbiters of legitimate religion and black Christians as illegitimate. So if it's helpful, uh, I'd like to ask you for your takeaways uh, from this election, uh, maybe beginning with a riff on, on, on that situation. So Anthea, why don't you start? You know, <laughs> Sarah and I could have a long conversation about this and we probably will on the phone sometimes. So I feel like you're all gonna be eavesdropping on what we normally talk about. Uh, you know, this is, this is an old playbook and I wanna pull back for a minute from the election and talk about 2008 and, and other things. There's a long trajectory here and the trajectory is basically about two things. One is Jeremiah Wright, but the second is black theology. If some of you remember back in 2008 and, and beyond, Glenn Beck used to have um, disparaged black theology on his shows. There was a lot of talk about Jeremiah Wright when he said, God damn America. And because there is this intersection between Raphael Warnock, you know, being at Ebenezer Baptist Church, his reliance on, you know, social justice in his, in his speeches and his, and his sermons, right? And that he was trained by James Cone, who was the father of like black theology. This is opening up a whole can of worms. What I find very interesting about this is that they're willing to do this in the seat of a place like Atlanta where black churches and big black mega churches are prominent, first of all. And secondarily, this is like, a you know, it's more than a dog whistle. It's basically like a bullhorn to white evangelicals to say, this goes along with Black Lives Matter and this goes along with these kinds of things and this is radical kind of thinking and it's not the same kind of Christianity that Martin Luther King had. And they're trying to strip him away from where he is in Ebenezer Baptist Church as the pastor of that church to try to make him look like he's a radical socialist, okay? So that's the game plan here. The problem with the game plan is that they don't even know their own scriptures anymore. Today, um, and, you know, I, I was just amazed by the, uh, one of the tweets that came out that was saying Warnock was basically not scriptural and talking about you can't serve God in war or something like this. And this is right from, you know, Matthew. And I'm thinking, what is wrong with these people that they keep doing this all the time? But I know what's wrong with them. It's racism. And that's the thing that keeps them going through this and keeps them attacking the black church because they know black churches are where voters get mobilized. Sarah. So I, I could not help but look at this through the lens of something that I reported on throughout, like basically from day one of Trump's presidency. And that was um, the culmination of a long campaign to monopolize on behalf of the Christian right, the idea of what religious freedom is. And that religious freedom means religious freedom for white Christians to get religious exemptions from laws that they don't like, or um, basically a license to, a legal license to discriminate against people if they feel like, or they claim that 
um, a law violates their sincerely held religious belief. So you saw that in the Hobby Lobby case, you see it in the cases involving exemptions to um, laws preventing discrimination, prohibiting discrimination against LGBTQ people. And in the past, obviously, we saw it in the context of Christian schools uh, after um, school desegregation in the 1960s, after, you know, after the 1954 Supreme Court decision in Brown. Um, and Trump is seen by the Christian right as the defender of that version of religious freedom. And it's just maddening, right? That they object if anyone questions that their view of what religious freedom is and that their view of scripture is the truth and the only accurate and only acceptable one. Yet where is the religious freedom for Reverend Warnock to give a sermon? And the other on, piled on top of that is just the number of times that they invoke Reverend King to support their position on religious freedom. And here we have the heir to Reverend King's church preaching in the tradition of Reverend King and they're attacking him like an anti-American outsider. And so what other conclusion can you draw but racism from that? It's just you know, like Anthea said, it's not a dog whistle, it's a bullhorn. And um, I think it really lays bare the poverty of their, uh, their position on what religious freedom is. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned Hobby Lobby because I've been thinking about uh, the uh, enormous privilege that that opinion gives to the category of belief. Of course, that's nothing new in, in Protestant Christianity. But one thing that we see in this election, which is uh, quite stunning to me, is the way in which belief seems to be a, uh, a perfectly legible way to trump truth and, and facts. Not just, you know, of course, our beliefs, our religious beliefs may influence the way that we choose to vote. But what we have seen in the last several years, and I know there's a longer history here, is the way in which uh, issues can be uh, managed by recasting matters of fact as matters of belief. So you believe in climate change or not. Uh, we saw uh, Amy Coney Barrett in her confirmation hearing deflect a question about climate change by saying it's controversial and she didn't want to uh, address it. But in saying that, she was already uh, sort of seeding the, 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 the position that climate change is real by articulating it as a question of belief. It's controversial. I have an opinion. You have an opinion. We're not going to go there right now. Uh, we're hearing reports from nurses in intensive care units in North Dakota now, which if North Dakota were a country, it would be the country with the highest rate of COVID fatalities in the world. And these nurses are reporting that uh, patients are dying angry and bewildered because they have a disease that they don't believe exists. Um, we also have uh, a case uh, of 70 to 80 percent of the Republican electorate not believing that Joe Biden is the winner. Uh, we had seen that this was a very secure election. Uh, there were no credible reports of fraud. Um, but uh, nevertheless, the, the vast majority of the Republican electorate uh, claims a belief that, in their view, takes precedence over, over the facts. So how has the deep history of uh, the white evangelical vote as described by both of you in your recent books uh, laid the groundwork for this extraordinary power that belief assumes or it is conferred on belief but, but that it just assumes now in, 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 in public discourse? You know, this is an interesting question. I'm gonna answer it in a way that probably people might not think I would say. I think a lot of this has to do with the kinds of media that evangelicals consume. And what they've consumed for a long time has been in a sort of a bubble. You can read Christian publications, you could watch Christian programming, you know, in the 70s and 80s and beyond, you could watch different kinds of televangelists and other people. Now you can watch Fox News, you can, you know, partake of all kinds of um, right wing organizations and things that you can read, whether that's Breitbart or some of the other things that are out there right now. And so you can be in your own information bubble. And I think that 
those information bubbles that evangelicals find themselves in, whether they be Christian ones or other ones that are the kinds of political kinds of bubbles that Republicans have constructed through a, a media campaign, are the ways in which they have sincerely held beliefs. And I'll use that legal term, sincerely held belief, because it is what they really do believe. And I also think that, I, I think back to when Google and all of these other search engines first came in, and it sounds funny to put this all together, but I think it's really important. It, it's a way in which people don't know how to read the internet anymore. They don't know how to look for the thing that to tell the fake from the real, because it's so real. If we, we think about the kinds of things in AI where you can see somebody's face or something like that, where you, where you see something and it looks completely real to you. And there's also a predisposition and evangelicalism, and I know you'll pick this up later when we talk about QAnon, to believe the conspiracy theory, to really think about this. I keep thinking about, um, I mentioned on Twitter the other day, somebody needs to rewrite the paranoid style of American politics, because I think now we could talk about the paranoid style of American politics and religion, because there's a paranoia that's going on. And there's also sort of a conspiracy theory that's happening on top of the regular apocalyptic things that evangelicals believe. So I want to go with, I think that people are in their bubbles and their sincerely held beliefs are, are predicated on, they think they know the truth inside of them and that what they see is true and that their version of God reaffirms what they think is true. Now I know Sarah's gonna have a different kind of answer for this, but I just want to kind of put it in this sort of religious studies kind of realm to sort of think about the ways in which these kinds of streams come into evangelical thinking and some of the people that are, you know, as they're being intubated, screaming about this isn't real. And I'm like, what universe do you think you're in? You are in an ICU. You have COVID. You wanted to not wear a mask because, you know, Donald Trump told you not to wear a mask or your governor said you didn't need to wear a mask. And now look where you are. And I think that this sort of reality, I don't know that the reality even comes up until people see bodies stacked on each other. And I hate to say that, but I think that we're at that moment in which the only reality that they're going to acknowledge or realize is the reality of losing a loved one or losing their own lives. Uh, Sarah, before you, you begin, I just want to comment, Anthea, you know, you talk about the bubble, of course, in a bubble, your beliefs can have precedence. But what we are seeing, I think, is that the, the, the bubbles are dissolving and, and belief is moving into, you know, what we used to call real life. Uh, and there just doesn't seem to be any uh, any good way of, of marking that difference between sort of an online fantasy and then what, what actually yeah. dictates one's behavior uh, regarding public health, for example. Uh, so Sarah, help us understand this. What, what gives belief such power uh, this year? It, it, seems, it seems bigger and mm -hmm. is there a remedy? So I think that the Christian right, which is sort of the core of Trump's support, um, they have been educated and indoctrinated to believe that secular society, secular government, um, science, higher education is the enemy of Christianity, right? And so this is why they've developed this very robust and wide ranging argument about religious freedom. It's not just about contraception and it's not just about LGBTQ rights. And it wasn't just about desegregation in the 70s, 60s and 70s, although obviously it was a lot about that. It was, it was just a broader um, claim that their version of Christianity should drive our governance and any effort by any other force outside of that was an attack on Christianity. And so if you've been marinating in a culture that pounds this home to you, not just on Sunday, but like Anthea said, in all of your various media and social media bubbles, then it's hard to disassociate yourself from the idea that, you know, Anthony Fauci is the enemy of Christianity because he's trying to make you wear a mask and violate your freedom or that, you know, it's a hoax. It was, you know, it, it was the Chinese virus or whatever the number of conspiracy theories that Trump has also promoted about this. And so if your worldview is that the government is illegitimately run by secularists and only legitimately run by Christians with your biblical worldview, 
and that God's hand is on Trump and he's the anointed president. I think it's it would be hard to disentangle all of that from what's actually going on with COVID, for example. Uh, so let's talk about QAnon because that uh, strikes me as the, the the most vivid example of a uh, an internet reality bleeding into real life and now really moving uh, the rest of us uh, in 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 various ways. Um, so what is QAnon? What is it? How does it work? Uh, how is it like religion? How is it unlike religion? Uh, where does it sit in relation to the white evangelical vote? I think the you know we, Sarah, you've been very uh, helpful in allowing us to see how rock solid the white evangelical vote has been and continues to, to, to be white evangelical support for Trump. I think the only other demographic that is as supportive of Donald Trump is the QAnon demographic. Um, and they overlap in some respects, but in many respects, it, it seems that they're you know, not the same thing. So help us to, to understand that. And then get, given that we now have put some QAnon adherents in the house, <laughs> Uh, what is the power of QAnon likely to be going forward? Right. Um, so QAnon is a conspiracy theory um, that is based on an anonymous character called Q, who um, started in 2017 with a drop on a, a internet message board, um, which was a signal to people to start looking out for the fact in Q's mind, um, that there is a cabal of satanic uh, worshipers who are also child traffickers and pedophiles who are running a deep state inside the government. And their goal is to overthrow, or during Trump's presidency, their goal was to overthrow um, his presidency, but he was going to um, emerge victorious and vanquish them. Um, but it was, it grew to be more than that because Q would do these drops with little hints about various things, sending followers down infinite rabbit holes, trying to figure out and understand various things that were happening in the news in the context of this insane conspiracy theory. Um, and it became very influential on white evangelicals partially because it was um, disseminated mainly through social media, Facebook. Um, and a lot of the, the nuts and bolts of it um, were things that white evangelicals seemed familiar to white evangelicals, um, that perhaps this illegitimate secular government um, is a deep state that's at odds with um, your anointed president, Donald Trump. The idea that, um, there were pedophiles or satanic worshipers uh, inside government is a conspiracy theory that dates back forever, but also particularly to the Bill Clinton era when white evangelicals were pushed uh, by Jerry Falwell Sr. and other evangelical leaders to believe all these crazy conspiracy theories about, um, about Bill Clinton and about Hillary Clinton. And obviously a lot of that just sort of bled over into Hillary Clinton's own presidential campaign, lock her up and so on. Uh, so evangelicals sort of fell into, uh, a lot of evangelicals fell into QAnon and there were a lot of evangelical leaders who were aghast about this. And I had a very interesting conversation with um, an evangelical, a Southern Baptist who edits a Southern Baptist newspaper in North Carolina. And he was very dismayed that evangelicals were falling into this and going to their pastors and asking them questions that were clearly generated by some crazy Facebook post that somebody shared with them. Um, and he said, look, as evangelicals, we believe that the Bible is the truth, not some crazy conspiracy theory, which of course opens up a whole other host of questions about what truth is and what, you know, who has the right or the ability to say that the Bible is truth or this interpretation of the Bible is truth. But I just thought that that was a really interesting, I, I have pondered that uh, statement that he made to me, you know, in the months since, since I talked to him because of that um, sort of incongruity or tension. Uh, but I do think that evangelicals are susceptible to a lot of these conspiracy theories because a lot of the, what, what it masquerades as theology 
like end times theology is really just a conspiracy theory that sends them also down rabbit holes trying to inter interpret whether you know different events are the sign of the beast or a one world government and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, something that uh, my colleague Carolyn Forbes reminded me of this morning is that uh, if you if your worldview is messianic, you live on a different timeline than another person who has a different way of organizing reality. And that seems to be a point of connection between QAnon and evangelicalism, that there is definitely a messianic uh, trajectory here and expectation. And that seems to contribute to our deep divisions in that if people are living in, in effect, two different time zones, really. I mean, two different ways of imagining uh, the, 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 the future. Um, then there, we're, we're, we don't really inhabit a shared world. I mean, we don't, we're not working on the same, uh, you know, in, 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 in one group is in sacred time, what they think of as sacred time, and another group is working in this world. And that just opens a rift, which I think we're, we're seeing now in a big way. But I wonder how successful was this pastor in uh, dissuading his congregation from this conspiracy theory? Would, did they, were they- well, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't a pastor. He, um, he edits a, a newspaper. He does work as a volunteer pastor at, at his church. Um, his aim was to sort of lay out what Q was and to show them not only that it was nutty and you know, just not credible, uh, but also that it was at odds with their Bible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think uh, other evangelicals that I've talked to seemed, um, you know, who are in leadership positions and are dismayed by Q, you know, seemed, I don't want to say defeated, but, you know, demoralized by it. Because I think that, that they can't, it's very difficult to come up against uh, the flood of social media. And now with members of Congress, these new members of Congress, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who are, you know, have expressed um, support and for QAnon, it's gonna become even harder, I think, because that gives it a legitimacy because they're a member of Congress. And what is the connection, uh, and this is for either of you, between QAnon and uh, race? I mean, does QAnon encode racist messages as well? Is it, you know, how does that work? You know, I'm gonna be honest and say, I have not looked at this as clearly as I need to. What intrigues me, however, are the people of color who I've read about who have fallen into QAnon. And, and Sarah might know a little bit more about this because I think they're coming into QAnon on the same basis that white evangelicals come in because they've been interested in these theories. They're kind of primed for it because of certain kinds of moral beliefs, right? So if you think certain things about children, I think it's really important to sort of think about, I'm always gonna pull us back to history, sort of the historic trajectory of satanic panics, right? Mm -hmm. And like the McMasters and all this other thing. I see this as a sort of a continuation of that in a, in a very different way, but it's, it's related to all of those, right? Because you imagine that there's children being abused or that something has happened to them and we have to rescue them. I think the difference is with this one is that the messianic figure is Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really different. So if we're gonna talk about people of color in Q, then I think we have to also talk about the people of color who also are for Donald Trump and, and why they're for Donald Trump. And I think of them as being, you know, um, a lot of them being, you know, Latino evangelicals or others who got targeted in the election. We could talk about that later. That did not happen in Arizona as much as it did, let's say in Florida. But I think the, the thing to remember is, is that where people find themselves in a church, especially if they find themselves in a multiracial you know, church, they might be susceptible to this more than they would be in you know, a predominantly Latino, Black, or Asian church. Because I don't see that coming in the same kinds of ways as it would through these kinds of avenues. And then the finally, and then I, I wanna hear from Sarah too, I'm thinking about this in terms of social media. To me, Q is like the person who is on Facebook like a whole lot, right? And, and reading some things or they're reading, you know, certain kinds of blogs or certain kinds of you know, esoteric material, right? And so you have a predisposition to wanna to go down the rabbit hole in a different way than say somebody who's just consuming the six o'clock news at night and looking at their local news and that's that. So I, you know, I think this is why probably, you know, people who didn't have anything to do with QAnon voted for QAnon candidates because if you say something that sounds, you know, relatively normal or relatively like a Republican and don't say the conspiracy theory out loud, 
you just you, you could vote for that person and that's how we end up with people like that in congress um, I have heard that in the pandemic, people are spending uh, six times as much time on Facebook, uh, yeah. which certainly uh, you know, laid the ground for, for some of this stuff. But one of the reasons Kimon really interests me in this um, post-truth world that we're trying to make sense of is it brought people into the Trump camp who are not culture wars conservatives. You know, a lot of women find their way into QAnon through spirituality and wellness sites. Uh, Anti-vaxxers find their way to Q. Uh, so how then Q, uh, the QAnon conspiracy theory makes Donald Trump supporters of these people is very, very interesting to me. Um, I also wonder if, you know, the, the, the QAnon conspiracy th stuff, I think about Jeff Charlotte's point that, you know, it's almost embarrassing to talk about it because it's so weird, you know, the lizard people and the drinking um, of, uh, you know, pulverized uh, organs and so on. I mean, it, it's just, it's hard to talk about uh, in, 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 in serious ways. And so it doesn't get looked at closely enough, but it also makes some of the conspiracy theories swirling now around the election seem kind of, you know, okay. I mean, they pass muster because uh, in the conspiracy theory world, they're not even that crazy. Well, at the risk of sounding like I'm promoting a conspiracy theory, I have wondered whether the person purport or, or people purporting to be Q and dropping these little pieces of information for the minions to run after and, and chew on um, knew exactly what they were doing. That the idea was to send people down rabbit holes. The idea mm -hmm. was to make people question literally everything. Um, and the idea was to throw out enough um, little crumbs for enough different kinds of people that you could ensnare a lot of different people coming from a lot of different backgrounds or belief systems into this uh, devaluation of reality. And, um, you know, we journalists who have spent way more time than I have investigating QAnon and looking into who might be the person or people behind the identity Q um, have not been able to determine who that who that person's identity is. Um, but it just, when you sort of take a longer view at it, a wider view at it, it just seems very much like a manipulation to me um, because it has produced, it has spawned all of these Q experts who have their YouTube videos and YouTube tried to shut them down and Facebook tried to shut them down, but that's a total whack-a-mole kind of enterprise to get rid of it. Um, but they've created chaos and now, you know, and then why not, like you said, why not believe that the, the election was tampered with if you believe all this other completely unhinged stuff? Yeah. And that's really a, a you know, a, a time-honored technique of totalitarian propaganda that you just flood the, you know, you flood the, the, the information channels with all kinds of stuff. So that you know, there's no, um, you know, as Hannah Arendt says, you know, we lose our grounding, we lose our bearings uh, when uh, you know there is so much um, cont contradictory information and being contradicted, you know, by author by uh, um, uh, you know authorities, then uh, no one knows what to believe. So might as well, you know, let um, you know uh, this particular view carry the day because this guy has the most lawyers or the most money. Um, so yes, that's a that's a very astute reading, I think. Um, what about uh, you know realignments or new alignments? Um, this gets back to my question about what it did anything surprise you about uh, uh, religion and the vote uh, in this election? Do you see um, there's been a lot of talk, of course, about the Latinx vote. Uh, uh, Trump seems to have um, upped his numbers among uh, Latino men and in some places, African-American men. Uh, we see the Latino vote maybe splitting along Protestant Catholic lines. Um, do, what, what, what kinds of alignments struck you? And what kinds of realignments are possible? You know, I know, Sarah, you're, well, you're both gonna tell me I'm terribly naive, but I'm just waiting for some white evangelical congregation to say to either of you, or to Robbie Jones, you know, this doesn't describe us. These white racists that you're talking about, we don't want that to be us. Um, well, there are those people. Okay. They're there. They're they're there. They're they, there. Can't, they, can't, they can't penetrate yeah. the broader. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I feel like that piece in the Atlantic this week by Emma Green 
about Andy Stanley was one of those, oh, we're really not like that, but we're not gonna talk about it, but it looks like, but you are this, this is what you don't wanna see, right? And I think that, you know, what shouldn't, I, so let me talk about surprise and not surprise. So not surprise is, you know, evangelicals held really tight for Trump. I mean, that was gonna be that to the end anyway. I think what was surprising for me was that the micro-targeting that the Trump campaign did worked on Latinos, you know, especially down in, in um, but we're talking about the Cuban population in Florida. What's interesting about where you are in Arizona are all the Navajo that came out for Biden and, you know, and the, and the Latinos who came out for Biden who've been working on this for a long time for the Democratic Party in Arizona. And I think that was a coalition that fell off a lot of our radar screens because we weren't paying attention to what was happening in these sort of in, in these sort of micro places, okay. So I think that that was a big thing. I think on the Catholic front, I'm not going to say that this is a surprise, but I think that um, you know because the Catholic vote looks like from the exit polls that it split almost down the middle, 50-50 Trump Biden. I think the surprise is actually the how loud they were about not wanting Biden, and that the kinds of arguments that you would see that you think you hear about you know, a Catholic running for the presidency were not the arguments that you heard. You heard more about you know, how horrible he is, how this is about abortion. You know, we just had the bishops yesterday you know, basically you know, issue a warning to uh, the, the incoming president. And I'm like, y'all are really just, you are on something right now. And I don't wanna say what I really wanna say about this. I'll probably say it at some point later on. But I think that those kinds of pressures are very, are very, very interesting. Let me say one more thing about black men. I think this was a huge conversation for the African-American community, especially the way in which there was outreach to certain rappers and, and things like that. So we, so if we're thinking about Kanye to break up the black vote, as it were, or they thought he was going to do that, but that was, you know, not the case at all. Or if you think about the kinds of um, figures that he went after, Trump went after like Lil Wayne and other, other people like this. I think that's like a showpiece, but I think what's more important is to think about the ways in which African-American men might feel alienated from traditional black church kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. And especially now with COVID and all of these things affecting the community and the dire economic straits, they may feel a certain kind of way about this. And I think that while we look at black women and being the bulwark of the you know, Democratic Party, and especially black religious women, I think we have to take another look at black men and try to think about what, what is really happening with that voting block and to not just look at it as a huge voting block, but to look at it in terms of age and, and you know demographics and things like that. Sarah? So with the caveat that you know the exit polling is still a little bit on that preliminary basis and um, that this year it's, it was just methodologically, I think, difficult and a bit of a mess. Um, with that caveat, um, I would say I think the thing that surprised me the most was that Trump, I think, found 9 million more voters than he got 10, 10 million. in 2016. And I think I was surprised by that. Like, I thought that he might have tapped out on the number of, um, of voters that he could find. And I think a lot of them were probably were uh, white evangelicals. There were there was a greater, uh, I think, raw number of, of white evangelicals or white white conservative Christians uh, vote, you know, which can include, um, you know, white white conservative Catholics and white um, conservative mainline Protestants um, voting for Trump this year and over 2016. And I guess I, I guess I was su surprised. I, I guess I kind of felt I thought I thought that he had this solid base that wasn't going to move away from him. And it didn't. I was sort of surprised that they added up. They were able to add on, um, and I think that that is due to the messaging that the Christian right had very consistently throughout his presidency and the campaign that he was, you know, the most pro-life president in history, the most pro-religious freedom president in history. These were talking points that were just repeated all the time, and so if you were getting messaging as a, a white conservative Christian voter who hadn't voted in 2016, and you were getting messaging both that, that 
Joe Biden was going to ruin America or come and take everything you own, which is definitely messaging that was coming at voters about Joe Biden, disinformation that was coming at voters about Joe Biden. And the contrast being that that Donald Trump was the most pro-life and most pro-religious freedom president in history. Um, I guess that's how they mined those additional voters. Pretty amazing. It is amazing. Yeah, that was a, that was a surprise for me too. That there were 10 million new voters for Donald Trump. And the polling was, you know, uh, not terribly incorrect in terms of the, 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 the spread, the winner, but it was way off by the numbers. And the 2018 polling was not way off. It was pretty close. So it looks like there are people who come out when Trump is on the ballot who didn't necessarily register or, you know, in, in, in any way went in 2018 when Trump was not on the ballot. Well, well, I, the wonder, polling I wonder if in 2016, there were white evangelicals who were skeptical of Trump because of the Access Hollywood, because of his history and so on, and then were nonetheless receptive to the idea that he proved during his presidency that he was their ally or even their savior um, and then came out for him. I don't know. I mean, like, I don't, I don't know that we'll ever know the, I don't think there's one answer. Not every voter was motivated by the same thing. Um, but yeah, I just, I, that was amazing. <laughs> Yeah. Can I say one more about that 10 million? I mean, I think one of the things that we, we forget is to think about, you know, you got to give Trump credit. He did have a good game plan in terms of thinking about how to micro target voters and all this. One of the things that was an early story was about how they were micro targeting Catholics as they came out of mass by, you know, where they were, where they would go to mass, you know, what kind of uh, parish was it? Was it conservative or liberal, you know, and how they would send certain kinds of messages to them you know, so that they would know how to, you know, vote or how to judge them as to being, you know, conservative or liberal. So I think we have to think about the ways in which that campaign was able to sort of weaponize this kind of targeting in a way, and to also think about the ways in which this, this lockdown, and, and Sarah kind of alluded to it, but I want to say a little bit more about it, the ways in which the lockdown allowed people to really have to spend all that time online, first of all, and secondarily, to spend time in bubbles that reinforced who they, of the kinds of things that they think, right? So all of these things got reinforced in a certain way. And then also, you know, you get 10 million voters, more voters, if, you know, A, the economy is good, B, you, you are one of those people who are, like I would say, I think it's a misnomer to say values voters now, because I'm not sure if it values is the right word. But to think about, you know, all the judges and all these people who got appointed by Trump, it, it made evangelicals and people who are conservative strong again in certain kinds of ways. And so you might want to come out and vote for that as well as, you know, there's a vote for racism in here. We have to say it, whether you like it or not, there's a vote for racism. There's a vote against immigration. There's a vote against, you know, women. There's a vote against gays in there. There's a vote against there's anybody. There's a vote for sending, to sending yeah. police into the streets yes, of America. Yes, exactly, like exactly. Law and order. There's that vote for law and order. And when you see all, everything that's happening and all these people protesting about Black Lives Matter and George Floyd and everything else, of course, you're going to come out and vote because, you know, a lot of the co commercials I saw here in Philadelphia were like, oh, we're afraid. Somebody wants to say defund the police. And that just drove this conservative kind of voting right to the polls to vote for Donald Trump. Anthea, I'm struck by something that you said about uh, Black uh, men, uh, perhaps in particular, uh, falling out of the space of the Black church in, in COVID. But white evangelicals don't ever seem to fall out of their space, right? Whether yeah, they're going to the church in the pandemic or not, there's no outside yeah. space. Yeah, uh, which I think is very, I mean, that's a, that's a, a, a striking thing, you know. Uh, at the center, we worked with some churches over the summer in, mm -hmm. uh, and, and other folks who were working with churches to help with COVID relief. And we were struck by how many black congregations were really needing to, 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 to just start from square one in terms of doing online stuff and virtual yeah. um, kinds of, of, of congregating. But there's no outside, it seems to white evangelicalism. You can't fall out of it if you're- if No, you're you can't fall out of it because I mean, the, the structures are there to support you, whether that's a small group or something like that. It's not to say that those don't happen in Black churches, but Black churches weren't ready for the pandemic in certain kinds of ways because they didn't have, a lot of them, especially small storefronts, don't have an online outreach. People show up. You, you know, the whole reason is to be in the congregation in that space and you want to be with people. But I see these larger mega churches and other churches already had things that were sort of online 
or you could stream the service online or something like that, right? So there's not a way for you to fall out, so to speak, or there's ways to keep you to keep you cooked in. I, I'm thinking about this um, person, and this drives me crazy that I'm going to bring him up, uh, Son Fucht, I believe I if you pronounce his name, who was going around the country doing these worship services and just like the huge COVID spreader. I think him, between him and Trump, they probably spread, you know, they were both super spreader events because you could come to Sound Fucht and go worship, you know, and they had thousands and thousands of people in Atlanta, in, Na in Nashville. I think he probably Minneapolis. came to Phoenix. Uh, where else? Minneapolis. Minneapolis, yeah. So there were these huge like worship events that were just like, you know, thousands of people there all singing, all spreading COVID, you know, and singing is like the, one of the worst things you can do. And there's ways for you to plug in that you, that, you know, regular black churches don't necessarily have. And then at the beginning of COVID, you started having all these, you know, church um, bishops and church of God in Christ died, you know, these big figures, you know, Detroit is a big black church center and a lot of people died there. And that really sort of affected how pe how African Americans have been thinking about COVID. Although I just saw a, a church, I believe it's in Virginia or North Carolina, that they just had their convocation and they came regardless. They just had big events, and you shouldn't be ha having events that of that size right now. They were all masked, but they're still br bringing together in a convocation kind of thing, and you know, days of evangelization. I just wanted to add one more thing about evangelical churches and COVID. They weaponized COVID, right? Yep. So that yep. again became a religious freedom thing where they were mm -hmm. fighting the government. The restrictions were a violation of their religious freedom. There were dozens of lawsuits. They reached the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. There's one at the Supreme Court now about COVID restrictions violating religious freedom. And so once again, it was sort of neatly packaged into the pre-existing framework of the government is anti-Christian and we are fighting for our religious freedom. And um, that, uh, I mean, it persists even now, even after all of the, um, these arguments still persist, even after all of the spread and the spikes and the third wave or whatever surge we're in, uh, even after the president had COVID. I mean, uh, so I think that that just shows you how strong that religious freedom claim sort of keeps people politically in in the mind of in mind of that kind of view of what their church is for and its positioning vis-a-vis -vis the government. I have one more question before we invite audience participation. Uh, and it's about the divide that characterizes the electorate and and the nation. Um, it looks like it, it, it could look like a, a culture wars divide. It can look like you know an evangelical, non-evangelical divide. But what I'm seeing increasingly is that this is a truth divide. It's a divide between people who want the con, you know, want to uh, believe that COVID is a hoax and that they're never going to get it, and that climate change isn't real, and that Donald Trump won the election, and that uh, you know his his um, lies are just a good way of governing, or they're not lies. You know, there's sort of a a, a, a faction of the country quite now vocal and 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 um, demanding uh, who who don't want truth and then there's a group who voted against lies against falsehoods against um, against these very very dangerous uh, ways of distorting reality Biden assembled a very interesting coalition ideologically I'm not sure it's going to hold uh, between people on the very very far left and people on the very far right who just had had it with Donald Trump because they'd had it with his lies so Biden needs to govern, you know, govern this coalition, but he also needs to govern across the truth divide. Trump never wanted to do that. He only wanted to govern his base. But Biden promises to be the, the president of all America, whether you voted for him or not. But you can't, um, you know, the difference between truth and falsehood is not a difference that you can bridge with, you know, civility and graciousness and equal time for both sides any more than, uh, you know, reporters get it right when they, uh, you know, give truth and falsehood as both sides of the story. So how do you govern across the truth divide? How do you, uh, you know, I, I know this is a huge question, so kind of unfair for me to leave for last, but um, uh, you've had you've had advice for, for uh, President-elect Biden and Thea. Um, what, would you, what would you tell them about governing across this divide between uh, people who want the truth and people who don't want the truth? I'm gonna be really honest with you and I would tell it to him just like this, don't try. 
Hmm. Because because right now, you know, we're on fire and let's face it, I mean, they're going to be, you know, we've already crossed 250,000 people who are dead of COVID. Um, there has been no, you know, package put out for anybody, an economic package that's going to help anyone. Um, so all of these things, there's a lot of things that are going to lift as of 1231. By the time he takes office in January, it's going to be a mess and we'll probably have a lot more people dead. And so I think that the imperative is not so much to try to bridge the truth divide right now, is that to save us all from falling into a big giant crevasse, because that's where we're going. And I think that if you spend time trying to help the people who don't want to hear the truth and don't do anything about it, don't want to do anything about it, you're wasting your time. I think this is something for that, you, you know, I, I think about, I'm going to make a comparison here. He, he cannot go into where he's going with the naivete that Barack Obama had to think that Republicans were gonna work with him. Those days are gone. I think the problem is, is that people really believe that we can come together and do all this stuff. This is not it. This world is polarized right now. And I think the only thing that you can do to help work on polarization is to make sure that the, the, the democracy doesn't fail because it's still on a precipice. We still don't know if we're gonna fall off over the cliff or not, but we're basically holding on by a couple of thumbnails right now. And I don't think that the first order of business for him is to try to go placate this. I am so, I just need to just bend here for a minute. I am so sick of everybody placating all of these people, especially white people who wanna believe all of this stuff and like, you know, kowtow to their beliefs and they don't believe anything that's true. They don't believe anything that's real. Yet and still, we're gonna. It, are we? How many times can we interview somebody who's a Trumper that doesn't believe anything? I mean, when are we gonna ask somebody here in Philadelphia who's been trying to get, you know, a COVID test and can't get one in their community and they're waiting for the Black Doctors Consortium and they're about to get evicted? When are we gonna ask that Biden voter what do they think about what's happening? And so I see this bridging of the truth divide is again once reinscribing the racism of this country that ask us to go talk to those people who are absolutely batshit, I'm sorry, I'm gonna say it, who don't believe anything and who want to oppress other people. That is the whole reason why they are where they are. They believe the lie so that they can be in power. And that is the thing that we have to start to understand about this truth divide, is that those who don't wanna believe in truth want to retain power that is rested in white Anglo-Saxon Protestantism and patriarchy. Sarah, I wanted to ask you, how, as a journalist, how do we report a truth divide? And Thea has given us some great suggestions. I, we have so many questions, though, in the chat, and I want uh, to, to bring Sarah Lords in to uh, help us with those. But I invite you, uh, Sarah Posner, to answer as a journalist if it feels right to do so, because that's something we're very, very interested in. How do you, how do you report on, uh, on a truth divide or in a truth divide, in this epistemological rupture that we find ourselves in? I think that the, the media has done a good job on fact-checking Trump a lot of the time. I think the problem is, you know, rather than, you know, taking statements he's made and trying to debunk them, the media really needs to think about reframing the way it covers political campaigns and the inner workings of Washington in particular, right? Because what we're going to have now is a both sidesing of why a COVID relief package isn't getting passed. There's one reason why there's a COVID, there's no COVID relief package passed, and it's called Mitch McConnell. Okay, and so there's not like, oh, Washington is broken. Why can't the two sides come together? The House passed a bill in May, in yeah. May, and McConnell refused to bring it up on the floor of the Senate and instead confirmed Amy Coney Barrett and I don't know how many other judges to the federal bench. Or so, today, I think. <laughs> right, yeah, and so exactly. there's, not, there's, not, there's not some like big mystery, why is Washington broken? Why can't the two sides come together? It's very clear what the problem is. Uh, and so I think that the, the media has to stop pretending like they have to sort of make it seem like it's equal or the fault is to be laid equally because it's not. And then that's just a fact. That's not me because I, you know, am liberal. It's that is just the the obvious 
set of facts that we're dealing with. And so I, that is where the press really needs to go with this so that we don't just like fall into a like, oh, well, maybe we need to like investigate whether Biden has any corruption in his administration. You know, that's not, that cannot be the first order of business to run down every little uh, Breitbart dangle of some like possible thing when Trump was the most corrupt, broken, authoritarian president in our history. You can't just then say, okay, now we have to like examine Joe Biden's presidency in precisely the same way. Uh, so that's my, that's my soapbox. I, I need to stop you because we have so many people with questions and I'm inviting now Sarah Lawrence, who is our communications guru in the Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict to, uh, to share those questions. Yeah, thank you so much for, uh, what a fascinating discussion. Um, thank you, Tracy. For those of you who are on the webinar, please feel free to submit questions via the Q&A function. Um, they are really pouring in, so we'll just get to it. Um, and I'll try to coalesce them in different themes. So if your exact question hasn't been asked, uh, we'll try to touch on some of the issues that you guys are interested in. So our first cluster of questions that came in um, during the event focused on susceptibility. And one of the things that this project is exploring is like the post-truth moment. So um, Anthea and Sarah, do you think that we are experiencing a new unprecedented rise of conspiracy theories and linking it to religion? Um, do you think that being religious, especially being very religious, primes individuals to be more susceptible to absorbing targeted messages um, uncritically? That's an interesting question. I don't think being religious necessarily makes you that way. I think it, it gives you another kind of a gateway to get to it. But I think right now, the bigger question is, is how does the internet make you susceptible to this, right? And where you are on the internet. So I think that's a big piece of all of this. And, and this post-truth moment or wherever it is, you know, it used to be called the postmodern moment. Now we're thinking it's the post-truth moment, right? I think is one that is very interesting in the sense that now what we're seeing is religion and politics coming together to weaponize non-truth to see how you can manipulate people to do certain things or to vote certain ways or to have certain kinds of beliefs. And so I think, yeah, it's gonna be, this is something we're gonna to continue to deal with. It, it's not going away. I don't, I just want to add, I don't think that we're having more conspiracy theories than we have before. They're, they're obviously, uh, spread virally more easily than before. But I think the main issue is that we've never had the president of the United States and his political party endorse and promote them. And that's the big difference. Yeah, so looking forward, do you think that we'll have sort of the same issues in tackling attacks on information in future presidential elections? And if so, um, what advice or hope can you give as we move forward to preserve the democratic process here in the US? What about how we no need to come with a ready answer to that? Where where can we look for hope? Um, I think that uh, I mean Trump is wage Trump and his allies are waging a war on our democracy. There is it, there's no other way to understand this present moment, and the Republican Party is enabling him, and they know better. The senators were on the Senate floor yesterday for the vote on the Fed nominee, and they were congratulating Kamala Harris when she showed up on the floor. They know what's up. They're just enabling him. And so until one of the two political parties that's enabling this stops doing that and supports the democratic process, like the Secretary of State, the Republican Secretary of State in Georgia, then we're gonna have a lot of problems. So, you know, people, People have a voice here and people have a means of pressuring uh, political actors as we saw in Wayne County yesterday. And so that is, that is the little glimmer of hope that they will respond to the, what people want um, as opposed to just responding to what conspiracy theorists want. Yeah, exactly. And I think also one of the things we have to sort of say here is that the Republican party of now is not the Republican party of eight years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago or even 30 years ago. What is happening right now is sort of an intransigence that Trump is sort of kind of weaponized in a way. It's always been there, 
but he weaponized it in a certain way to which you can't move past it. He's broken, he's run through every guardrail that there was. And so now the question is going to be, how, are there gonna be guardrails anymore? How do we get them back? How do we think about the, the ways in which our democracy is structured? How do we think about what we, basically the Republican party is a broken party right now. It is broken. There is no, you know, I know it's gonna be upsetting to some people who may be listening to this, but the party is broken. Your party does not function like a party. I wrote a piece a while back about how Republican party is a religion and now it's a religion. It's not a party. It is a religious party that does certain kinds of things. And when the Taliban is endorsing Donald Trump, you need to start to think about what has happened to your party that is so broken that the Taliban looks at your party and says, Dad, that's a, that's a platform that we can believe in. Wow. Um, I'd like to jump in here uh, and just follow up with Anthea. Uh, I know in your new book, you think a lot about uh, what is morality when the Republican Party, who in uh, 2012 said that you know a, a person who's immoral can never be a good a good president, now they're the most likely to say that doesn't matter. A person who's immoral can be a good president if God, you know, yeah. is God anoints him to do it, right? <laughs> King Cyrus. So, so we've seen uh, you know a, a, a rush of forgiveness of uh, Donald Trump's sexual peccadilloes, but do you what 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 is going through? Um, what do you see when Donald Trump? actually instigates violence, you know, or, or his lackeys instigate violence against the governor of Michigan or against, uh, you know, the Secretary of State in Arizona is reporting threats on her life. I mean, what do people who follow, who want Donald Trump to win and want this campaign to be successful, what goes through their minds, do you think? when I think what goes through their on... minds is patriarchy. I think what it is is how to control women. I think that what goes through their minds is nothing different than they see from some of their pastors who would, you know, would say, you need to straighten up and act right or else, right? And so this kind of violence, whether that's the violence against Gretchen Whitmore or the violence that happened in Charlottesville or the violence that happened, you know, at the AME church in, in, um, that everybody was killed at. I think these kinds of violent events and the violence that Donald Trump, you know, incites and that evangelicals don't say anything about is quite all right with them because they see those people as being out of bounds and out of line with the authority that God has given to Trump. So this is where I, I, I really want us to understand that you, know, you can't keep giving people a pass for these kinds of things because morality, they use it as a shield. And that's what I talk about in the book is that the moral suasion that evangelicals have all talked about actually belies everything they've done in slavery, what they did in the civil rights movement, what they did in, you know, in the 70s through the 90s, what they believed about apartheid, what they believed about people in the inner city. All of this stuff is, is about control, racism, and patriarchy that you use to say, well, you know, you're being immoral, so we can't have you as part of polite society, and we're the moral arbiters. Yet, yet and still, you still have evangelical pastors and evangelicals all the time who sleep around and do all kinds of things. So, you know, of course, they could accept Donald Trump. That's just what their leaders do. Ooh. Hot takes. All right. Um, kind of leaning into that a little bit. Can the left um, claim or perhaps reclaim religion as a moral and political tool in the same way that the right has for decades? And perhaps maybe not in the same way, Anthea, since you're you know, noting that it's a broken system, but what what might that look like going forward um, to sort of use those those religion as a platform for mobilization? Yeah, I think what it looks like, you know, I'm thinking about Reverend Barber for one, there's lots of different pastors around the country, Otis Moss um, and others who are starting to think about well, how do we how do we work with things like, you know, people's overpaid medical bills and things like this. I mean, how do you get back to the basics of the gospel, you know? of doing all these things, or even if let's take it out of Christianity altogether, how do we start to think about bringing inter-religious inter coalitions together of Christians and Jews and Muslims to think about ways in which you're gonna improve your communities to feed people. Right now, we have issues that are gonna face this country for years and years and years in terms of medical care, in terms of economics, in those things, and in terms of education. And what has happened with the right is that they've infiltrated all of these things and basically turned Christianity on its head and said, you're only blessed if you are rich. You only can do things, you know, you only can have an education if you go to a private school. You only should live in certain kinds of places 
there are all sorts of ways in which Christianity has been turned on its head. And I think that for the left, they need to think about the ways in which they can get back to some of the basic messages. Sarah, anything else to add? Well, I think that the religious left is very robust as a mobilizing, organizing, community organizing movement. And I think people tend to have the misperception that it's weak compared to the religious right, but that's only because it is not organized or conceived of in the same way that the religious right is, because it's not a movement that wants to uh, impose a very um, doctrinaire uh, view of the Bible on everyone else. They're a movement that is, is seeking to represent the interests of the people who have been forgotten by our you know, corporatized politics. So um, I, I think that it's important to seek, if, you're, if you think that it looks weaker to you than the religious right, I think it would be valuable to seek out more information about the way these various movements work or these organizations or religious left organizations work. Um, and then, you know, maybe that would ch change the way you might perceive that. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we've got a cluster of questions sort of asking now about President-elect Biden. Um, what do you both think on um, this, you know, him winning the election says about the country? Does it, um, in is it indicative of uh, a moral shift? Is it, what does it say about religious people who voted for him? Um, sort of what, be, what was realized in this election and with him actually winning the election? I'm gonna let Sarah go first. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a huge question. Um, <laughs> I think um, I, I would have loved to have seen him win by a much bigger margin given the historic corruption of Donald Trump's presidency. It's really kind of shocking that someone who is, is causing us to slide into autocracy could win the votes of nearly 74 million Americans. I find that terrifying. Um, <coughs> On the other hand, on the bright side, um, Biden flipped, you know, the what's known as the blue wall, the the Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan. He flipped Arizona. It was historic. He flipped Georgia, also historic. And I think that goes to the power of coalitions that we're often not thinking about because I think political reporters tend to be thinking about white people, right? But like Anthea said, the Navajo Nation in Arizona, young Black voters in Atlanta, in the Atlanta suburbs. I mean, these are the various movements that powered Joe Biden's win. Um, black people in Detroit, Black people in Milwaukee, Black people in Philly, right? And so um, we need to think about why why did they feel that urgency? And why did maybe white people not feel that urgency? And they felt that urgency because Donald Trump is an existential threat to their lives. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and you know, so it's not surprising then that they would come out and f flip this for, Bi for Biden, perhaps to many on the left, an imperfect candidate, but the candidate, the only candidate that we had to uh, reverse this slide into authoritarianism. Yeah, exactly. And I think you know what Sarah says is really important, but we also need to think about the people who grudgingly voted for Biden. I know a lot of those, you know, the, the, the Bernie people, right? And these are the people who have been pushing for, you know, changes in terms of minimum wage and, and bringing the wage up and Medicare for all and all of these things. And what I think, you know, Biden has going for him right now is that things are so broken that having him is going to be like a breath of fresh air. That doesn't mean he's the greatest or anything like that. And I'm saying that even though I was involved with the campaign, it doesn't mean that. What it means is that people want to come back to normal. They, they're ti we're tired of somebody tweeting every day. We're tired of the crazy. We're tired of the histrotics. We're tired of everything. And right now we're in the midst of a, you know, an existential crisis that is, you know, bodies in, in trailers in El Paso. I mean, we, you know, hospitals overflowing. 
And there's going to be a sense in which this country is going to have a lot of brokenness. It's not just about the, you know, the poor, aggrieved, you know, white Republican who has been, you know, has had a hard time or the farmer or everything else. It's everyday people who are bagging your groceries or bringing your Instacart order or all of this who are going through really terrible times right now. And I think that Biden can speak to those people. I also think that he's somebody who will be able to offer comfort. And I know that's kind of a, you know, a strange thing to say, but he's known grief. And I think that this country is going to be going through a lot of grief, you know, in the next few months and years to come when people finally realize the extent of what has happened with COVID, even though we have a vaccine on the horizon, there are going to be a lot more people who die because they don't want, either want to get the vaccine or they die because they're unable to receive it or they die because they just don't believe in wearing a mask. And the fact that you could politicize a mask, which is supposed to help both you and the pers- people around you. And that could, that could be the simplest thing that you could do to stop this virus. And in other countries, we can see how it's gone down because of that use. It is ridiculous to me to think that we will continue to fight these stupid battles about this stuff and that he has to come into office thinking about how do I unify this country when the fact of the matter is, is that we're, we're in such a place of peril right now. It's you know, really close to failing. And also one more thing, the, the talk about authoritarianism, I think is really key because what we have to understand is that a lot of people, especially evangelicals in this country, they would just rather have a king or a queen. It'd be easier, probably most likely more king. And they like the authoritarianism and they like all of this because it's, it's a caretaker role. In other words, they don't want government too much. And what we've seen with Donald Trump is that he's completely stripped government down to the nub. There's nothing left. He's, he's firing people left and right. It's not working. There'll be so many you know, holes to fill that were never filled before, even throughout this administration, because he just didn't care. And so the whole thing is broken. And, you know, what Republicans asked for, they got, they got broken government. And yet, and still they're appointing judges so that they can be legal and doing the legal kinds of things to people, but they don't have a government that works. And so I hope if Biden does anything, he can give us a government that works. All right, um, we'll ask one more question. Um, and then Tracy, I'll pass it off to you for closing comments. Um, A lot of what people are writing right now just comes from a place of exasperation and stress and a lot of worry and fear about um, what this questioning truth moment means, what conspiracy theories mean um, that we're seeing on social media today, the rise of disinformation, especially in a pandemic. Um, Anthea, as you were just saying, it's we're literally in life and death uh, moments of reality right now. What advice can you give to viewers, myself even, um, what, as we, you know, hope to combat disinformation, as we hope to continue promoting truth and seeking truth and recovering truth um, in our day-to-day lives? That's a good question. I thought you were going to ask, how do I talk to my grandparents? I th- that might be a part of it. Okay. Us. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I really thought you were going to ask. Well, you know, if you're smart, first of all, you won't be seeing people you know, around the table, you'll be in your homes, you know, quarantining because you don't need to be around ta- around the Thanksgiving or Christmas table eating with them. So that's the first thing. So maybe that's going to be, you know, a, a stopgap measure. I think the way to, to help people is to first, you know, sort of confront it. I, and I mean, I think that people are afraid to confront because they don't want to lose relationship. But as I like to tell people about, you know, the racial stuff, you know, basically, if you don't confront your parents, your grandparents, your friends, your, your siblings, whoever it is, about the races, and that means you're harboring races. And that's a hard thing for you to think about, but it's really true. And I think that goes for the kind of QAnon stuff and everything else. You have to start to feed people information that they can see for themselves and say, why don't you read this? This is going to get you out of your bubble. Why don't you listen to this podcast? This is somebody who's talked about what QAnon means and and what that what that um, what what some of these things are. And you can you explain to me where they come from? I, I just finished reading a piece about uh, a Latino gentleman who came out of QAnon but his father won't speak to him. And they're kind of living in the same house in this kind of a strange condition. And I think it's gonna mean a lot of broken relationships, but you have to be ready for the broken relationship if you're gonna hold on 
to truth in your area of life. And I, I mean, I, I don't mean to say that you should cut people off, but I also mean to say that you have to understand what the, what the penalty is or what, what happens to your life if you continue to harbor people like this. I think you have to really ask that question. I would answer it in a more global way as opposed to you know, your one-on-one -on -one relationships with people. Um, and that is to be politically involved because we are at this incredibly dangerous moment and we need everybody to be politically engaged, whether it's you know, working on a campaign, volunteering for a campaign, writing your Congress, congressperson or senator, so on and so forth. The truth is that it's really only one of the two political parties that is fomenting this anti-truth anti -truth moment and fomenting conspiracy theories. And the other party, which in a couple of months will have um, control of the White House and that bully pulpit again, um, is for truth, right? And to get rid of these conspiracy theories in our public life. And I think we have seen both moments of complete cowardice and moments of great courage at this time. I'm gonna contrast Emily Murphy, the General Services Administration Administrator who refuses to sign the paper to release funds to the Biden transition because she hasn't ascertained that he's the president elect, which is preposterous and possibly criminal and a complete dereliction of her duty. And then contrast that with Secretary of State Raffensperger in Georgia who has blown the whistle on the Trump campaign and Senator Lindsey Graham instituting a pressure campaign on him to throw out votes, right? It's insane. But I mean, like, I still like, I, you know, you read about this and you see this guy interviewed and you cannot believe that this is happening. So I think that it's very important to stay, to not disengage politically. It's, it's tempting to disengage because everything feels so crazy and unhinged right now but it's important to stay engaged on the side of truth, on the side of truth tellers, and on the side of that kind of courage and stand against that kind of cowardice, which is continuing to foment this kind of destruction of our democracy. Um, now is not the time to disengage. Now is the time to be all in. Sarah, thank it will you. also make you feel better because you'll feel like you're doing something. Yeah. Sarah, thank you. I just want to point out that the Georgia Secretary of State is a Republican. Your example yes. of Georgia is a Republican, yes. so there's hope uh, for, for the party. I'm also thinking of that uh, you know, fellow in Michigan, just a citizen on a Zoom meeting, got that elect election board to, to, to rethink its crazy vote on not certifying, yeah. um, not certifying the vote. So he was a citizen who dialed in and, and, and made, his, made his voice heard. Sarah Posner, uh, Anthea Butler, I'm so grateful to be in conversation with you. I wish we could go on and on, and I wish even more that we were leaving here and going to a beautiful dinner together. Um, <laughs> but we'll, 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 we'll do it. it. It'll just be, uh, we'll have to push that out a little bit uh, into yeah. the future. So thank you so much for joining us. This was so rich and uh, enjoyable and um, um, thought provoking. So thank you for the work you're doing and thank you for being with us. Thanks thank for having you, us, Tracy. This is great. And for those of you that are still watching, um, the links for both uh, Ms. Butler's and Ms. Posner's books are available in the chat. Um, this event has been recorded and is available on our YouTube channel. So go feel free to check it out and send it to someone if you thought the conversation was interesting. And finally, just a brief um, recognition that this is the last event of our fall semester. So while we won't be seeing you, know that we at the center are just going to continue on, our, on in our work. We are still working with journalists to preserve democracy through the Recovering Truth Project. We are still working with students to help them build critical thought skills um, in addressing information in their day-to-day -day lives, our student programs, and we're still collaborating with um, brilliant minds, um, these two very much included, um, and our faculty and staff. So if you are interested in supporting our efforts, information on how to do that is available at csrc.asu.edu forward slash support. Um, thank you all so much for attending and thank you for this fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone.